fun world, weary world, weary, living in a great big town. Good day class, welcome to history class. Today our first real class and we're going to have several lessons in which I'm going to tell you How did the war start? More specifically, what did each of the great individual powers on one side the allied forces and on the other side the central powers what did they do to create the climate wherein the murder of one person could start a global conflict so great? Well I just talked about that one person who got murdered and of course I'm talking about Franz Ferdinand but just the murder of one person does not start a war so we have to back up quite a bit and not just a bit but way back. This is what makes time travel possible. I'll show you how it works. I'm going to start right after the defeat of Emperor Napoleon. Because Emperor Napoleon created a Europe that he desired, basically meaning his strong friends in the middle of the rest of Europe. And if it were up to Napoleon, all of Europe would have become France. But Napoleon couldn't keep his winning spree up and eventually he got defeated, kicked back to an island and uh, the peace started to be drawn out uh, during the Congress of Vienna. While the first island couldn't keep Napoleon in his place, so he snuck out with his men, got right back into war and the French people being fed up with the new government cheered for the return of their great emperor. So Napoleon started a new army, plunged Europe straight back into war in 1815 and that didn't work out quite well. As most of you will know, Napoleon was defeated during the Battle of Waterloo. <laughs> So having defeated Napoleon at Waterloo, the powers of Europe decided that it was time to get right back to the drawing table, being certain Napoleon would never be seen of again, which was true actually. Four victors of the war of Napoleon got together in Vienna to create a new peace to rearrange Europe. And these four powers were Great Britain, Prussia, Russia and Austria. So what did they want to do with the Congress of Vienna? Well, first off, during this Congress, France got its borders shrunk back the way they were before the French Revolution. Prussia got its land firmly set strong on both sides of the Rhine, making it a more geographical, tactical land, uh, harder to conquer. The southern German states remained in the organization the same as Napoleon had made them. Austria gained the Venetia region, pretty much the north of what we now call Italy, that was given to Austria, for making the country stronger and uh, bigger. And finally the Kingdom of the Netherlands remained as it was, still a kingdom but with a new king, no longer a Bonaparte on the throne but an heir of William uh, of Orange, the new king of the Netherlands. So the main thought of the Treaty of Vienna was to create a stable Europe that would no longer plunge itself into war every time something happened. And this seemed rather true. Uh, Europe was stable for quite some years. There were two exceptions in the stable Europe. The Netherlands internal quarrel within its borders. The Belgians were no longer agreeing with the fact that they were ruled by the Dutch. So in 1830 the Dutch started their war against Belgium. Didn't work out that well. England had to intervene and Belgium became an individual country with a new king. Until 1859, with the exception of the Dutch and Belgian quarrel, Europe now remained stable. For now, this is what they accomplished with the Treaty of Vienna. The main goal of each individual country would be to maintain the balance of power. Lastly, what the treaty did accomplish was that there would be no more quarrel about the colonies. Colonialism was something many of the European powers aspired. They kind of stopped that with the treaty and now the only great colonial power that remained was Great Britain. And because they were alone within uh, their colonial empire and they were unrivaled, it allowed for them to create their splendid isolation politics. No other country could uh, touch them. So they kind of backed away from Europe as it were. So the uh, French Revolution pretty much pawned Napoleon and uh, eventually created the Treaty of Vienna in which all things were rearranged the way they were before the revolution. After that revolution there was a new revolution, not so much a political revolution as the French Revolution had been, but a new economic and technological revolution. And of course we're talking about the Industrial Revolution. So the Industrial Revolution changed the world in quite another way, not so much as diplomatics, but the way manufacturing had been done and the way we spent our money. So while the main goal of the Treaty of Vienna had been to return Europe to the way they were before the revolutions, they had the idea that the people would not change. Quite the opposite happened. The Industrial Revolution changed both the way people lived and the way people used to think. 
The people who made the Treaty of Vienna were of course the noblemen. The noblemen were the people who uh, decided what was going around Europe at the time, which was a perfectly normal thing at the time and everybody accepted that. But because of the Industrial Revolution, capitalism came and normal men, commoners so you will, were now capable of being quite as wealthy as a nobleman. Except the main difference of course being that they were not noble. So you got on one side the noblemen who still were thinking that they were the people in charge. Then you got the people, the new capitalists, the owners of the factories. They got rich and they decided it was their time to make a difference in the world. Why should a nobleman have something to say? And why should they have nothing to say? And the third problem is of course the common man, not everybody got rich. They wanted to have something to say too because they felt exploited by the factory owners. So these three categories kind of clashed and started a new revolution in 1848. So 1848, commonly known as the year of revolution, is not quite the same as, for example, the French Revolution or the Russian Revolution. The French Revolution has been mostly in France and the Russian Revolution of 1917 after that is a revolution mostly uh, concerning Russia. Of course, in the long run, during the Cold War, you, we were talking about the rest of the world. Well, not so much in 1848, because during this year, pretty much all over Europe, everybody started revolting. Important to know is that even though everywhere in Europe, the various countries started revolting and the citizens started becoming unhappy, demanding pretty much the same things, which were one, a constitutional government, two, independence of unity of nationalist groups and finally free the ending of serfdom there where it still existed. But even though the people of various countries all sort of like uh, wanted the same things to happen, there was no such thing as a master plan, it was more of a spontaneous uh, combustion of all these frustrations people had. Of course, once a revolution in one country started, it could ignite a revolution in another country. So this was a revolution, one against the class system. Secondly, this was also a revolution for nationalism, demanding to be unified as various nationalist groups or to be separated to create their own nation state. Uh, unfortunately for the people who revolted, the revolutionary powers eventually got defeated. Not all that much had changed. For example, France started out being the Second Republic of France. Only one year later, Emperor Napoleon III sat on the throne of, of the Second French Empire. So what did change with the revolutions of 1848? Well, the most significant change of the revolution had been the way the European countries thought about politics. The first 30 years after the Congress of Vienna, the way people reacted to one another and the way uh, politics, especially to other countries, had always been to remain the balance of power. But after these revolutions, the nations started caring less about this balance of power and gained more interest into uh, what they wanted. Self-interest became more important and they were no longer shunning war to make their goals come true. I also talked about nationalism and this is quite important because it is going to be one of the main things eventually starting the First World War. Nationalism and the idea of the nation state became more important after a 1848. This doesn't mean that after 1848 everybody started revolting, making their own nation state, but people started to talk about it more openly, started philosophizing about it. And the idea uh, itself is something that is of course the very first thing everything starts with. In 1860 there were only two uh, real big nation states in Europe, one being England or Great Britain if you will and the second being France. Of course, after 1860, more nation states started to be developing, but it wasn't something that would just be created out of pure spontaneousness. Wars had to be made in order to create a nation state. But before we go to these wars, of course, it is important to go to the war before that, because that war uh, made it possible for the other two wars to actually start to ignite. And we're going to talk about the Crimean War. Cannon to right of them, cannon to left of them, volleyed and thundered. So the Crimean War wasn't as much a nationalist war, not at all actually, but it was necessary in order for the other two nationalist wars to start. So what happened? In short, Great Britain, France and the Ottoman Empire stood against Russia. Russia demanded access to the Mediterranean Sea because in that way they could expand their navy and be more powerful. Of course, Great Britain, being the empire with the splendid isolation, felt threatened by a new possible strong navy of another country. So Britain stood against Russia, but 
France came along because the French also felt threatened. France had uh, various countries in the east of the Mediterranean and they also did not want to have any competition on that front. Both France and uh, Great Britain decided that it would be a smart idea to have a buffer state in between uh, Russia and the Mediterranean. And they choose the Ottoman Empire because in between the Ottoman Empire there lies the Bosporus which is basically the sea port allowing Russia to come to the Mediterranean Sea and without that it would not be possible. Lastly Piedmont would also join. They sent 15,000 men in order to stop Russia which basically is nothing uh, compared to the vast numbers of soldiers France and Great Britain sent but it allowed Piedmont to gain prestige and possible allies in the future so that's why they also joined in. So Russia of course seeking aid against this vast army standing against them, these three countries, four if you count Piedmont, they needed access to the Mediterranean Sea. So Russia naturally turned to Austria and asking Austria will you help me? Austria didn't help Russia. Um, which actually was uh, quite a slap in the face for Russia because in 1849 Russia had helped uh, Austria against Hungary but what Austria did not realize at that time perhaps is that it left Austria pretty much without any allies in the years to come so the war went pretty bad for Russia and uh, it wasn't a, a pretty war at all something had to be done and luckily for Russia perhaps their Tsar, Tsar Nicholas died and his son, his son of course, the heir to the throne, became the new Tsar and the first thing he started to do was to create peace. So Alexander II within a year ended the war and made peace. Russia was the big loser of this war, so they had to pay up. But more importantly than just the uh, Black Sea affair and what happens there, pure economics, more importantly is the reputation of Russia. Because Russia after Napoleon had always been the country that defeated the empire. Russia, in the eyes of the people of Europe, always had been this big, strong country everybody should be wary of. Now that reputation collapsed and Russia's weaknesses were exposed to the rest of Europe. So lastly for today's class, we are going to talk about the new colonialism. Of a matter of fact, imperialism. So colonialism is of course nothing new to the world. Europe had always colonized everything and uh, that was the way things were. After the Congress of uh, Vienna, Great Britain was pretty much the only great colonial country left standing. Uh, this also has to do with the fact that European countries just didn't seem to care all that much about their colonies. If they had colonies still, well that was great, then they would just keep it that way. But the real drive to, to conquer more colonies, there was just none in the 19th century. Well, all that changed with the Industrial Revolution and after 1870, as a matter of fact, colonialism got a great revival. Everybody wanted a colony again. The Industrial Revolution created factories and the factories needed something to work with. So it was important again to have raw materials coming to your factory rather fast and rather cheap in order to produce. So during this new wave of imperialism, countries started to conquer and uh, divide new colonies amongst each other and everybody wanted colonies again. But something now was different. So they made investments. Uh, for example, they made mines, they also made railroads in order to get the raw materials faster from point A to B to the ship straight back to the mainland. If you as a country decide to invest a lot of money in a colony, you better make damn sure that your colony will be yours and not just a random colony. So whereas in colonial times it was just enough to have trading posts and trade with the people, now they wanted their investments to be safe and secure. In other words, the colonies had to become a part of the mainland and European powers actually got much more active in their territorial and their political investments in these countries. So effective use of the colonies made the mainland richer, but it also became an instrument of prestige. The more colonies a country had, the more important it was, so this created new tensions between countries. So this was all lesson about Europe after 1815. So what happened? Napoleon rearranged Europe, the Treaty of Vienna rearranged it back with of course some slight tweaks. Then the Industrial Revolution came along which pretty much changed the way people used to think about uh, how uh, the world worked and no longer were the noblemen in charge. All these frustrations came together during the revolutions of 1848. Not that much changed but there were of course some notable changes, one of which is the idea of the nation state. Lastly, the Crimean War changed the European map. Partnerships were formed, the partnerships were broken, and Russia lost her reputation. And lastly, the new imperialism countries got wealthier because of this new imperialism, but also there was much more 
tension between each individual country because everybody wanted a colony. So pretty much I built up until um, 1870, which is uh, the start of the next classes. The next class will be about Austria. I hope to see you then. Until then, goodbye. I'm old, weary, old, weary, living in a great big town.